I titled my message, The Holy Spirit, He Means So Much to Me. Uh, the title of that, of the, the title of the message has, I guess, a special meaning, not to get into too deep of detail, but I feel as though that there's been times in my life that I didn't really recognize the ministry of the Holy Spirit the way that I was supposed to. Um, I, I didn't... I didn't always reverence his presence the way that I was supposed to. I, I didn't recognize how much he's working and how much he does in the midst of our lives each and every day. Amen. And I got to tell you that I'm not there anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he really does. He means so much to me. And I want you to know that the Holy Spirit he is the third person of the Trinity. Amen. He is the third person of the Godhead. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work on the earth. Before we get into the, some of the scripture, I just want to kind of talk to you a little bit about, about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is the one that's doing the work on the earth. Even whenever Jesus was resident in his physical body, it was the Holy Spirit that was moving and operating through him. The Holy Spirit is all about creation. You know, whenever you look at the creation story, the word, what we understand is that the Father had a plan and the Word spoke the plan. The Word was the eternal Son. His name is Jesus. Spoke the plan of creation. And the Word of God teaches us that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And when the word was spoken, creation came to pass. Amen. The very spirit of God is the, in the Hebrew, the Ruah. In the, in the Greek language, the Pneuma. It's the breath of God that was breathed into Adam and made him a life giving made him a light a living soul amen in the new testament we're told in the letter to the corinthians that the that the spirit that that while the first man adam was made a living soul the second and the last adam jesus was made a living spirit amen and jesus asked the father to send the spirit amen and the spirit is now with us and he's upon this earth and and if you're born again this morning and we're going to talk a little bit more about that because it's important you understand that. But if you're born again this morning, I want to tell you something. The way maker lives on the inside yeah, of you. Yeah. You need to know that. I We need to be reminded of that. You know, I was thinking last night whenever I was going through my, in my mind some of the message, I was thinking, you know, you really don't have any problems, church. No, really. I want to tell you that. You don't have any problems. I don't have any problems. We think we have problems. We've been listening to the lies of the devil thinking that we have problems. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't have problems. We got the way maker living on the inside of us. We got the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of us. We have the creator of the universe living on the inside of us. And we need to start thinking that way instead of thinking the way that the enemy wants us to think. And so listen. The same way that creation took place when the earth was formed is the same way that the new creation takes place. It tells us that in the Gospel of John. It tells us that when the Word of God, see, the Word became flesh and He dwelt amongst us. Amen. The Word of God became flesh. He dwelt amongst us. And when He, see, the Father had a plan. The, the plan was that because of the fall of man, man was separated from the presence of God. And so God sent his presence in the form of his son to be the sacrifice that would pay the penalty of sin. Because you see, it, a, a sacrifice had to be paid. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus, when he, when he died on the cross, he fulfilled the plan of the Father. Amen. And when he fulfilled the plan of the Father, what it does is it makes ready, amen, for the Holy Spirit to now make your heart his home. And so if you're not born again this morning, you need to understand that in order to be born again, you have to put faith in God's plan. You have to come to the realization that you were born in Adam the first time. Man, Rich wrote a great song. I wish, look, maybe, at the, would you play it for everybody at the end? Brother, praise God. Y'all need to hang around for Rich's new song. I'm yeah. telling you, I feel like it's going to be a number one hit. Praise God. That's what I feel like anyway. But anyway, that we came into this earth born of Adam, born of Adam's fallen race. 
And that's why Jesus said you must be born again. And so Jesus died. Amen. And listen, we're going to talk about some of the scriptures. But he prayed when he said, it's good that I go away. So if I go away, then he will come. Who's he? The Holy Spirit. The breath of God. The life of God. The Spirit of God is going to come. And now listen, this is what happens now. When the word is spoken, just like in the creation story, when the word of Jesus is spoken, and then the Holy Spirit's hovering over the heart of man. Look, the Spirit of God is upon this earth to convict men and women of sin. The Holy Spirit is upon this earth to, to prove him, to prove Jesus to this world that we live in. And whenever that word it goes forth, the Holy Spirit is brooding over the heart. Whenever that heart receives Jesus, receives the truth of Jesus, not just mentally, and that's not what I'm talking about. You can think the truth about Jesus in your mind all day long. It's not till it makes that 12-inch journey to your heart where you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And when you do that, the breath of God breathes on you, my friend. The breath of God breathes in you, and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. And listen, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I thought about it, sister. Hand into the mic. I like the way you... Freedom, you know, I like the way you emphasize that that freedom part right there. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. I want you to know that this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Look, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. For if you walk in the flesh, you will die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. Come on. you got to let the Holy Spirit. He yes. says, if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds. What does mortify the deeds mean? Let the Spirit of God do the work of a mortician on your body parts. What are you talking about? I'm talking about your members. I'm talking about your The Spirit of God will do the work of the mortician on your body part. You will become dead to your old nature, to your first birth in Adam, and you will be risen to newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's the work of the Holy Ghost that does it. Amen. When the wind of God shows up, everything's got to change. I believe that. I believe it with all of my heart. And he said, he said, because those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. That's right. Yes, yes. So in order, if we're going to be the sons of God, we've got to learn how to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, what kind of voice is trying to lead us? Yep. Come on. Listen to me. There's a spirit in this world. You know that. He talks about it in Ephesians chapter 2. He, he calls, he's called the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that works in the children of disobedience. There's two spirits at play on the earth. There's two kingdoms at play on the earth. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. When you get born again, you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm here to tell you this morning that the prince of the power of the air, it, the spirit that's working in the children of disobedience is a voice that is very loud in the world today. He speaks to us through all types of ways. He wants to convince us that the ways of the world are what is right and that the ways of God and the word of God are antiquated, ancient, and outdated. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And, 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 but the enemy, if you allow him entry to whisper in your ear, he will start to wear you down and he will begin to convince you of the lies instead of you being able to hold on to the truth. But by the, by, in the name of Jesus right now, Father, we thank you for, you for the Spirit of God that proceeds out of you and the Son. Sweet Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Without you, we cannot exalt him. Oh, without you, we cannot understand him. Our, our glorious Jesus, who loved us and died for us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd have your way this morning. That you would speak and that you would teach, oh Lord, that you would preach, Lord God, and that you would perform what only you can perform. That you that you would cause change in our hearts and in our minds. That you would cause change in our families, Lord, in our marriages, <laughs> in our children, yes, and, in our finances, yes, in our jobs. Yes, Lord, we, we're just putting it all in your hands yes, because you're trustworthy. 
It's not all we can do. It's all we ought to do. Lord, that's what it is. It's sometimes we say, all I can do is pray. No, all we ought to do is pray. All we ought to do is trust you because you are the way maker, the promise keeper. Amen. Praise God. The Holy Spirit, he just means so much to me. And I'm so grateful that, that the Lord has begun to reveal that to me in a way like never, be, never before. So in John chapter 14, verse 26, this is the King James Version. Uh, the first thing that I want you to know about the Holy Spirit is that he is my teacher. All right. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. It says in John 14, verse 26, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now he was talking specifically to the disciples because Jesus said a whole lot of things, taught a whole lot of things, performed a lot of miracles. Amen. But Jesus promised that when the Comforter, the Holy Ghost would come, that he was going to teach the disciples all the things that were connected and bring back to their memory. But I want you to know that with the teaching of the Holy Spirit, I was thinking about this also during the day, that whenever I was working on my nursing degree, we got a couple of people that will be able to appreciate this. Maybe some of you will. I don't remember what we did in lab in high school. I don't think that I made it that far in high school. But in college, I remember in lab that in nursing school, there was, there was a physiology assignment and I never really liked lab, but I remember they, they, we, they dissected a calf muscle on a frog, okay? And what they were trying to do was to, was to mimic something called an action potential, which has to do with skeletal muscles whenever an elect, uh, electricity is formed through the changes of ions. I'm not trying to, I'm getting way too deep. Calcium and sodium and all these things, and it causes an electrical... I mean, this, this body is so fearfully and wonderfully made. You can't even make this stuff up. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, your own body creates its own charge of electricity in order for muscles to be... in order for the heart to be able to... Anyway, they, they took this little calf muscle of this frog, and they put it on some weights, and they keep some saline on it, but then they hit it with an electrical uh, probe, and that, that muscle would contract, and it would pick up the weight. And they keep hitting it with the probe and it would pick up the way. I started thinking about the way, you can go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 in a second. I started thinking about the way that the Holy Spirit teaches. Because you see, there's field work and then there's book work. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this, is that in this verse of scripture in 2 uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and we can stay in the King James Version, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it talks about, the way it talks about the, the teaching or knowledge is what it's talking about regarding the kingdom of God, regarding Jesus. And I want you to see that this particular Greek word that's, that's in there has a significant meaning to it. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 3, it says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So it's taught, when it says power right there, it's talking, the word in the Greek is dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. It's talking about an explosive power. It's talking about the power of God, amen? But, but, the, but the power of God is, and our understanding of all of the things that we need in this life regarding godliness is directly connected to the word knowledge right there. And what I want you to know about that word knowledge is, and look, I didn't know for sure how deep I was going to get with this because I'm talking about the Holy Spirit as a teacher. Okay, there, there's several words for knowledge in the Greek language. Okay, and what I want you to know is that this word right here was a prevalent word that was used during this time frame. We're not going to get into this a lot, though, but this is kind of like the knowledge you learn from a book. It's, it's informational knowledge. This word right here, you see, there's a division right here, and this word right here means a pawn. It's a higher level or a fuller understanding of knowledge. The reason I use the illustration of a lab is you can learn in a book about an action potential but when you see it happening in front of your eyes, it brings another level to the understanding of what is being taught. 
What I need you to understand is that the Holy Spirit doesn't waste anything. Sometimes whenever you're going through things in life, right, and, the, and, and, and you see even the way the song was singing, that he's a way maker, even when I don't see it, he's working, even when you're in the midst of darkness. I don't know about you, but there's been times, even in, in, even in my Christian walk, where I felt like I was in the midst of darkness. Many times I had opened up the doorway and I had entered in or allowed the, the, the trouble to come upon me. Right. But see, I can talk to somebody about sin. I can teach you about the sinful nature. Listen, I'm not recommending this. I recommend that what we do is we learn to have obedient hearts. We learn how to have humble hearts and we learn how to really hear the voice of God. Amen. Um, and that we don't open up a bunch of doors and invite a bunch of heartache into our life. Nevertheless, I will tell you this. That God has a special way, the Holy Spirit has a special way of teaching us even in the midst of those times whenever we've gone wayward. And see, whenever, see, I can teach you about the sinful nature. I can tell you that when you were born in Adam, you were born with a sinful nature and that the sinful nature is like a factory that produces sin and that that's the problem in the life of the believer is that if the sinful nature is awake and alive, then, then it produces sin. See, many times we get caught up in acts of sin, the verbs of sin. We get caught up in, you know, gambling or drinking or pornography or whatever, and, and, and we focus on that. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that the Word of God teaches that there's a, there's a problem above that, and it's this factory called the sinful nature. Well, the Word of God also teaches that what Jesus did at the cross and when we put our faith in that, and if we'll keep our faith in what Jesus did, then he destroyed the power of the sinful nature. And he does it. It's not that it's being eradicated. That won't happen until we receive our glorified body. But that the normal position of the sinful nature in the normal Christian life is, is that the switch is supposed to be turned off. Like it's supposed to be dormant. It's not supposed to be alive and inflamed in our lives. Anybody ever lived in a place, even after you accepted Jesus, where the sinful nature was alive and inflamed in your life? If you have, you know what I'm talking about. So I can teach you about the sinful nature, but really and truly, if you've experienced that, and then if you've experienced the freedom that Christ brings, hallelujah, there's, that's a whole different level of teaching. And so what I want you to know is this is that there is freedom in Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I want you to know that what he did for you at the cross breaks the bondage, uh, breaks the power of sin over your life. Amen. Even in your thought life. You know, Brother John was talking about that earlier. I want you to know that sometimes young people would say, man, I haven't really done a whole lot of bad stuff, but in my mind, I've done a lot of bad stuff. I want somebody to help me out here. Right. Don't tell me that that's not true. I know it's true. Because if you don't understand really what it means to put your faith in Christ, then the devil will have a playground going on in your mind. All right? And you're just one step away from making a big boo-boo. Okay? I'm here to tell you right now that you need to understand this, that you ain't got to make no big boo-boo. What you need to understand is that the Lord has set you free. What he did at the cross was more than enough. It destroyed the powers, the principalities. It destroyed the forces of darkness, but you and I got to get to a place where we're really willing to believe that. See, the enemy wants to try to convince us in our mind that he has power and control over us, but I'm here to tell you, he does not have the power and the control. Jesus has already done the work and the Holy Spirit lives in the inside of us, and we can learn to yield to the truth of what God's word Amen. says. So there's an experiential. That's what that word epignosis means. It's experiential knowledge. Yes, yes. I didn't plan on getting into that too deep, that deep. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit uses that as part of his teaching tools. Yes. God doesn't waste anything. <coughs> he causes all, to get, all things to work together for good to I those like that love the Lord. Yes, yes. yes. Amen. All right. So what does he teach? What does the Holy Spirit teach? He teaches Jesus. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit teaches. So I want you to go to John 16 and 14. And I want that's the subject matter that the Holy Spirit teaches. He teaches Jesus. Amen. 
Two things in, in verse 14. Number one, it says, Jesus says this. He says, he will glorify me. That's right. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to glorify <coughs> Jesus. Amen? Yeah, I want you to know that anything that tries to detract from Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen, I could go pull the book out of my office about the Azusa Street Revival. If you've ever heard of the Azusa Street Revival, it's where the day, it's where the second, where, where Pentecost hit America in about <coughs> 1904. And one of the episodes in the book talks about the fact that as mighty as the Holy Spirit was moving, people were being filled with the Holy Ghost. People were speaking in tongues. There was a man named Frank Bartleman that showed up and he said things had gone awry. And they had begun to worship the Holy Spirit and worship the supernatural and worship the gifts of the Spirit. And, instead, and he said, when I got up behind the pulpit, I presented to them Jesus and his sacrificial atonement. And they were convicted in their hearts at that very moment. And there was weeping. They had fallen to their knees and they were weeping with tears. Because I need you to understand something. Is that if the gifts are the emphasis. If the supernatural is the emphasis. And it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to accuse nobody of nothing. I'm making a statement that is verified in the word of God. That if Jesus is not the one that is being exalted, yeah. okay, then it's not the Holy Spirit. Because right. the Holy Spirit's ministry is to glorify yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Who said so? Jesus said it right there. He will glorify me. Amen? Amen. Then he says this, he shall receive of mine and he will show it unto you. So that means that the Holy Spirit is going to take what is Jesus and he's going to reveal it. To the saints of God. Amen. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit as teacher. He wants to reveal to you the things about Jesus that you need to know, that I need to know. Listen, that the world needs to know. The world needs to know some things about Jesus. Amen. All right. So I just put a couple of things down here. Number one, he's going to teach that Jesus is the way. In John chapter 14, verses 4 through 6, you can go there if you want, but I'm going to just read it. And where I go, you know. He's talking to Philip, right? In John chapter 14. He says, and, and where I go, you know. The way, you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where you go. He was talking to Philip originally, and then Thomas broke in. Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not where you go, and how can we know the way? Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I want you to know something this morning that the Holy Spirit is in partnership with Jesus. Yeah. You, you got to understand that. The Holy Spirit is in partnership with Jesus and that there is no other way and the Holy Spirit will never, ever say that there is. That's the right. Holy Spirit will never agree that there is another way other than Jesus. Allah is not another way. Buddha is not another way. Krishna is not another way. Wicca is not another way. Jesus alone is the door to the sheep. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And listen to me. If there's another spirit that's trying to tell you that there's another way to get to the Father and that it's not through the Son, then that is not the Holy Spirit. Right. Because the Holy Spirit will never contradict right. that Jesus is the way. Yeah. Somebody was sharing with me that they've been at work and that they've been witnessing Jesus at work. And that a person came up to him and said, man, you're saying it all wrong. You're saying it all wrong. Everything that you're saying is wrong. Jesus is not the Messiah. Jesus is not the Son of God. Jesus is not the only way. No, that is a lie, sir. That is a lie. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is partnering with Jesus upon this earth. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is looking for somebody to partner with him. Amen. That we would work together with the Holy Spirit to speak the truth. All right. That was the first thing is that he shows the way. Now, the second thing I want you to see is in Matthew chapter 2, verse 28. I actually mentioned this in my message Wednesday, but I think it's so important that we really get this 
solidified in our heart, okay? Because <clears throat> this is a good little mirror for your own soul, all right? Uh, what it says right here, it says that even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, the heart of Jesus is, is that is selflessness. Yes. The heart of man, if he has his way, is selfishness. That's right. You know, I got that revelation pretty big time way back in the day. I mean, one of my daughters is in the congregation this morning, but I, and, and, and it's not, no fault of theirs. We're all born like this. But I remember we were driving home, and I don't even remember how old they were. And I think it was early on when they maybe first started going to the new school and home. I was driving, and they were fighting in the back seat. You know, and siblings all the time fighting. They were fighting in the back seat. And I was looking at him, and I was like, y'all need to stop all that. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, humanity is selfish, but I am selfless. And it was so profound what God spoke to me in my heart that morning. But can I tell you that I have still been in an experiential training ground? Yeah. Can I tell you that even as loud as the Lord spoke yes. that to me, I'm still learning each and every day. Amen. How selfish the fall of man has made us and how selfless the Holy Spirit in us is trying to form and fashion Jesus in us. Jesus said that the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. Amen. All right. That, that's, that's the second thing. So he's going to, the Holy Spirit's going to teach us that Jesus is the way. The Holy Spirit's going to teach us the nature of Jesus. And I just real quick want to say this about the fruit of the Lord, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but whenever we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we can envision Jesus. I'm telling you right now, if you could see Jesus on the earth, this is exactly what he looked like. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. The Lord is meek. Yes. The Word of God says that the meek, Jesus said to his citizens that were going to live in his kingdom, that the meek shall inherit the earth. Meek is not weak. Meek is, is, is actually power restrained. Restrained with self-control. That's what the word right there, one of those words, temperance, is self-control. But you got to understand something. That's yourself partnering with the Holy Spirit in you because it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. See, and so we have to be willing to partner with the Holy Spirit whenever our flesh wants to go in a certain direction. And we understand that Jesus already died to give us freedom over that thing and the Holy Spirit's living in us. We have to partner with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will give us the victory. But, but listen, meek is not weak. Jesus was full of power. Jesus was full of power when they came to get him in the garden. And he said, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said this in the Greek, ego iamai. And what, did he mean? What, what does that mean? I am. Not I am he. The translators put he in italics. They, no, he said, I am. I'm the same one that was there when the bush was burning. Yeah. And when he turned around, he said, I am. Boom, they all fall to the ground. He said, don't you know that I can call on legions of angels? From up, all it took was one angel to destroy about 185,000 Assyrians in the Old Testament. You imagine if he would have called out thousands of angels, what would have happened? But see, the power of Jesus was bridled according to do the will yes. of the Father. Amen. And listen, when the Holy Spirit's working in you, he also wants to bridle you. He wants to bridle me. He wants, definitely wants to bridle Pastor Matt's tongue. I can promise you Whenever we find ourselves in situations, but he said, he that can control his tongue. Boy, that's what James said, huh? Yeah, yeah. The tongue is an unruly member, James oh, said. Yeah. Help us. He said, you know, and so anyway, you get the point. I didn't mean to preach on the tongue, but Lord, help us. So, so the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of Jesus in us. So many scriptures that we've even talked about recently where Paul even said, I travail, Right? I travail like a mother giving birth to a child until Christ is formed in you, till Jesus is fashioned in you. 
What I need you to understand is that the Holy Spirit is the one that's doing the fashioning. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the one that's doing the work upon the earth. But the Holy Spirit does the work in your life because he can, because Jesus did the work on the cross. When Jesus paid the penalty of sin and you get saved, it allows the Holy Spirit to come live on the inside of you. It allows the grace of the Holy Spirit to form and fashion you. Amen. But in order for that to happen, you and I have to yield and allow him to have his way. So that was the first thing is I wanted to know that he's teacher. But number two, he's comforter or helper. Right. And he provides comfort and help on the journey. Amen. So in John chapter 14, uh, verses 15 through 17, th this is what Jesus says right here. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Ooh. I, sometimes, you know, look, I'm all about grace. And, and I mean, when I mean that, I mean it like I'm all about grace. And, and listen, there's been times that even in this church that we have taken. Yeah, but obedience is the Lord's. Yeah, but obedience is the Lord's it's supposed to be transferred into you, my friend, <laughs> because the Lord does. Obedience is better than sacrifice. OK, so what I'm trying to say is this, is that Jesus said this. If you love me, keep my commandments. People are like, well, Jesus is the one that had to keep the commandments. Yes, I agree. Jesus is the one that had to keep the commandments. But look what he says right here. If you love me, keep my commandments, verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he will abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. What is your point, preacher? My point is not sinless perfection. Let's get that clear. My point is keeping the will of God in our daily lives with the help of the helper. My point is, is that the God who formed and fashioned the earth that we live upon and slung the stars in the sky and breathed life into a lump of clay named Adam lives on the inside of you if you are born again this morning and that the helper, if you will let him, will help you. He will comfort you. He will be by your side to strengthen you, to empower you, to walk according to the will of God. After all, Jesus paid a high price Amen. so that we can have access to that power. That's right. Praise God. King James uses the, uh, the, the word comforter and the ESV uses the word helper. Hey, look, I got this Amplified Bible. I use it as a commentary, okay? Amplified Bible uses the word comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, the standby. I like that word standby a little bit because, see, in the Greek, the word literally means, well, let me just go ahead and write it. You ready? Because I love these little compound words. The paraclete. Okay, paraclete is one of the ways you can say it, paracletos. Look, compound word, this, it, the, the most, listen, the most literal translation of this word would be this, side called. <laughs> he was called alongside yes. to help us. Yes, he is yeah. the helper. Hallelujah. He is the comforter. He's the standby, but he's not just on the side of you. He's on the inside of you yes. if you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. So he's been, he's been called alongside to help. Amen. And sometimes the word was used to describe legal assistants who pleaded the cause for someone else. Amen. A big meaning of the word is a person who publicly supports someone. You know, how many times in your life have you've been under and people have accused you, right? People might still be accusing you right now in your life about various things, right? I got to tell you that there's a place that you and I can come to where we can truly learn to trust the Lord and that we can let him be our defender and that he will begin to set us free from the things. Because listen, th this is the reality. If we're, if we're living in bondage to sin, the devil has an accusation. He, ha he has an accusation, but we have a plea. We have a plea in the courtroom of heaven. What is the plea? The blood of Jesus. And so when we begin to learn that and we begin to 
exercise that authority, then the accusations of the devil fall helpless to the ground. And not only do the accusations of the devil fall helpless, but the power of the Holy Spirit is given liberty and freedom to work in our life and to empower us to where we don't keep giving fuel to the devil. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just keep giving fuel to the devil because you can tell somebody all day long, well, you know, you're free, you're free. But, and it, but yet at the same time, if we keep on living in that mess, then, and, and then you feel many times condemned, right? Until the Lord gives you revelation. And then once the Lord gives you revelation and the, and the power of sin is broken in your life, Lord, help us. Help us when we experience your goodness and your grace and your loving kindness that we don't go back to those things. Amen. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. And that's only his grace that's going to keep us, my friend. I mean, and, 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 and uh, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. He paid a high price. So look, I just want you to know that that word paraclete is used in two different books in the New Testament. It's used in the Gospel of John, but it's also used in John's first letter. Look at this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He says this. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. I tell John messed up some theology, man. <laughs> he just really did, did he not? I'm just saying. And I mean, the, the Apostle John throws it to another level. He's telling us, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can live a life empowered by God. Amen. I mean, that's, and if a man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So what I want you to know is that that word advocate right there is literally paraclete. And so what it's meaning here is that Jesus is the paraclete. He is the one that pleads our case to the Father. And again, the plea is his blood. He sits, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, amen, and he ever liveth to make intercession for you. Some people say, well, he ain't praying for me. Oh, man, he probably, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I think he's praying for me. He, told, he said to Simon Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has des desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed that your faith fell not. But let me just say this. It, in addition to praying, he really ain't got to do that much praying because he just sitting right there. And whenever the, whenever the enemy comes to bring his accusation, I want you to get a visual of this. You ever been in a courtroom? Some of you are fortunate you never had to sit in a courtroom guilty. And that, but I have been in a courtroom guilty before. And they got the prosecuting attorney, and he's sitting there. And let me tell you, boy, I had a bad day in court one time. I'm not going to get into all that, but it was a mess. I'm talking about accusations. Oh, my God. Thank God my born-again sister, Debbie, was in that courtroom that day. Oh, well, she was my advocate. The Holy Ghost used her to be an advocate for me. I was about to go to jail. I'm telling you right now. And the Lord delivered me from that bondage. Praise God. But, but what I'm trying to say is this. I want you to envision yourself in a courtroom, and they got a prosecuting attorney. And he's sitting here and he's slamming you with accusations, amen. And Jesus is your plaintiff's attorney. He's your counselor. He's the standby. He's the legal standby. And, and now we're in the courtroom of heaven. And the Father is seated at the throne. And Jesus is seated at his right hand. And then the Father just looks over there. And Jesus is just... Shows him the hands. Yeah. He just yeah. shows him those hands, those yeah. male scarred hands. That he's the, the wounded lamb, the yeah. eternal lamb. It ain't got even to be a whole lot of talking. The father's like, I acknowledge that. I yeah. acknowledge that right that's there. Right. I see. Yep, that's right. You that's did right. it. Hallelujah, you did it. Yeah. I, God the Father said, he told me that the other day when we were worshiping. I have delivered on my promise. Yeah. He delivered his son. He delivered the lamb. And you know what? Jesus delivered on the promises of God. Jesus didn't quit. That's he right. endured. He endured the trial. Amen. He endured the shame because of the joy that was set before yeah. him. And the joy was that he was going to be your miracle worker. He was going to be your way maker. Amen. He was going to be your light in the midst of your darkness. I'm telling you right now, we got to start believing what the word of God says. God has already provided the way. So, so in that case, the paraclete or the, the side call is Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete because look, he undertakes the work of Jesus. Jesus is not here in bodily form anymore. Well, he is. But he's not. Jesus is not here in his physical body anymore. 
right? And so what, what, what's going on, though, is, is that the Holy Spirit is a spirit without body, and that's where we come in. We come into the picture because the Holy Spirit is looking for vessels that he can live on the inside of, that the Holy Spirit can release Jesus that, into this lost and dying world. Amen. And so in that sense, he is, he is the paraclete. Now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit as the side called one, if you will, the comforter, the helper, the word must be understood differently than the first John passage. Referring in that passage, it's referring to Jesus as our substitute sacrifice. It's referring to Jesus as our advocate because he is the sinless one that was slain. And again, the father looks at him and says he did what he was to do. Amen. But it's different than that. OK, instead, the Holy Spirit pleads God's cause with us. Now, let me just say that again so you don't miss it. Jesus, as our advocate, pleads God's cause for us. Outside of Jesus, we're guilty. In Christ, he paid the penalty. We're no longer guilty. The Holy Spirit pleads God's cause in us and through us. What I'm trying to say is this is that the Holy Spirit has a job, and we're about to transition into that in a moment. The Holy Spirit has a very specific job. In addition to being a teacher to teach us Jesus, he has a very specific job for the world. And he wants to plead the cause of Jesus to the world. And the way he pleads the cause of Jesus to the world is that he's in you and he pleads through you. You understand? Yeah. All right. Well, let's, right. let's take a look at that a little bit more. See, because what I want you to know is this, is that God, he works with us by working through us, right? The, you know, the Lord can use any form of creation that he chooses to, to bring glory. Amen. Yes. Yeah, he, 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 to accomplish his work. He can allow the wind to whistle over water lilies in the Amazon forest, mm -hmm. the name of Jesus. Right. He, he can he can uh, the name of Jesus. He, he can cause birds to sing his fame and donkeys to declare the character of his name. He can cause the rocks to cry out and sing his glory. But that is not his intention. His intention is that man will be the vessel that he uses. I need you to understand that. It, because, listen, it, this is not just a social gathering church. Some that may be the, the what, how some churches operate, but that is not what the Bible says. Yes. The Bible has a, a clear and distinct appointment for those that are truly born again. And those that are truly born again, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and the Holy Spirit wants to work through you. However that looks, that's between you and God. That is not Pastor Matt's job to sit here and try to tell you what that's going to look like. Amen. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Okay. But I, but I want you to know this is that he uses man as a vessel. Praise God. If someone is going to receive healing, deliverance, salvation, or help of any kind, it's going to be the Holy Spirit with the use of human vessels that will get it done. I mean, typically that is how I'm not saying that God is restricted and that he's in a box. I'm trying to make a point. If God is going to move upon the earth, he's going to flow through a human vessel. Somebody help me. When you're driving down the road from Morgan City to Lafayette on Highway 90, if you pay attention, you'll probably see at least one billboard that says something about Jesus on it. Jesus yes. saves or something like that, right? And, you know, this is, J Jesus is, I don't know, I'm just making stuff. Jesus saves. Jesus is, that may not mean a whole lot to you, but look, if there's tens of thousands of people that travel that, or at least thousands and the thousands of people that travel that every day, how do you even know what somebody's going through? Yes. That's in that car, right? right? Uh, you know, I've had friends of mine, not, it's not important who, that's their testimony, that said that there were times in their life, even after they knew the Lord, that they imagined, I wonder how fast I'd have to drive to run this car into that telephone pole in order to end it on. How many people do you think could be driving down the road and see that sign and it says Jesus saves? 
And they may not even know what that means. And they probably don't know what that means at that point in time. But the Holy Spirit can quicken that to their heart. Yeah, right there and say, no, I mean it when I say Jesus saves. And how he can move upon their heart and draw them to, to seek that out. What does that even mean? Even to begin speaking to the Lord in their vehicle like my friend Sean did on the way back from Oakland, California on his birthday. When he began to question the Lord, and the Lord questioned him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And my brother starts questioning the Lord. Why this? Why this? And the Holy Spirit, I don't remember the exact story, but it's his story. He said, well, why this, son? Why this? I'll tell you why. I'll answer your questions. You got questions for me? I got answers for you. And it ends up that the person gets saved. Praise God. Praise so what is my point to that? Somebody paid for that billboard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some human being wrote a ch stroke a check. Some organization had the finances to put that billboard up on. Is it somebody changing through the channels on the radio because they sick and tired of Jay-Z singing in their ear. They yeah. sick and tired of Beyonce or, or Cardi B talking about her newest thing, if she's even around anymore, I don't know. And, and, and they sick and tired because they, they realized that they did sold a bill of goods. They realized that they've been lied to. And so they flipped through the channels and boom, all of a sudden the song comes on. He's up. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. He's light in the darkness. And the Holy Spirit comes through those airways. Woo! And grabs a hold of their heart and says, Don't you know the girl's singing? She's right, man. She's right. Won't you believe her? Won't you call on the name of Jesus? Won't you let him into your heart? I'm telling you right now. Somebody had to be hurt here from the Holy Ghost. Somebody had to pick up their pen and start putting strokes on the paper. And somebody had to put music to the lyrics. And boom, there you go. God used a human being to release his anointing. Yeah. Amen. He uses us. He works through us. He's pleading the cause of Jesus upon the earth. And he's looking for somebody that will work with him. Amen. These are some of the ways that the Holy Spirit works. But look, number three, he's a convictor. <laughs> and look, what I want you to know is this, that there's not even really a word there. I made this word up. I made up my own word, my friend. I had to tell my iPad to listen to me. Learn spelling. Boom. This is Because see, even the word convictor is not a word. Convict, conviction. Uh, it said, one, of the, one of the versions, the King James Version says he will reprove. The King James Version says the Holy Spirit reproves the world of sin, of righteousness, sin, and judgment. I think it, that's what it was. Yes, yeah, sin, righteousness, and judgment. But I made up this word, and, 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 and this is the word. He is the convictor. <laughs> I know, I'm weird with words. But look, you know, I looked up, I kind of had a feeling. What do you think that this prefix means, even in English? The prefix con means with. You ever ate a burrito? A burrito? Con queso. Con queso. <laughs> Come on, my guy. I'm learning that menu. <laughs> con queso. Burrito with cheese. Con carne. Burrito with meat. Come on, with. See, the Holy Spirit is with. The victor. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I already said it once, but I'm going to say it again. The Holy Spirit is in partnership with Jesus upon this earth. And the Holy Spirit wants to get in partnership with you, my friend. And the Holy Spirit wants to use us and for us all to be together to do the work of the Lord. Let's look at John 16, verses 6 through 8. It says this. John 16, verses... Six through eight. We'll let him go ahead and catch up. Because, but because I have said, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So he's telling them, I got the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. And his disciples are sad, right? <laughs> sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Now, this is the ESV I'm reading out of, and you can switch it if you can, but you don't have to. I like the way the King James says it. It says, it's expedient for you that I go away. So the ESV says, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. 
But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, this is what he's going to do. The King James says he's going to reprove. The ESV version says he's going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now look, I want you to see John, uh, let's go to the next verse, in verse 9, because he begins to explain it. He says, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin, specifically because they do not believe in me. Now it's important that I explain this to you. It's one thing to believe intellectually that there was a man named Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago and that historically you believe he died on a cross, two pieces of wood, and you could even believe that he died for the purpose of paying the penalty for sin, and you could even believe intellectually that he did that for your sin, but never believe from your heart, and until you believe from your heart, you're not truly saved. And the way that you know that you've been saved, at least in the past, is that at some point in time in your life, the Holy Spirit started to convict you of sin and started to show you that things needed to change in your life. Now, you can reject the voice of God. I don't recommend it. You can push away the voice of God. You can walk in rebellion against God. And when you do that, the voice of God becomes less clear. But hallelujah, as soon as you repent and lower yourself under the hand of God, you'll start hearing the voice of God again, and he will start to work in your life. So, you know, people say, well, I believe in Jesus. Okay, but if you don't, because if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're still in your heart. I'm talking about in your heart. If you don't believe in Jesus in your heart, then you're still dead in sin. I want you to know that, that people can believe in their mind, but that's not what we're talking about. Because, see, the Bible says this in James chapter 2, verse 19. My sister used this one on me when I first was getting saved, my oldest sister, Debbie. She said, she said, you believe there's one God? You do well. The devils also believe, yet they tremble. It's not good enough to believe in your mind that Jesus is real. The devils also believe that Jesus is real, but they tremble in the presence of the Lord. So that's number one. He convicts the world of sin. But in verse 10, it says this, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no longer. Listen, the, the, the resurrection is the proof. I'm telling you, the power of God is in the resurrection. Yeah. Yes, without the cross, there is no resurrection. But you cannot, you cannot put the resurrection on the back burner. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Paul says it. We didn't like it when we were trying to figure it out, but let's just take it for face value. He said, if, if he did not resurrect, you are still dead in your sin. If he did not resurrect, if he's still in the tomb, you are still dead in your sin. The reality of it is, is that the power is in the resurrection. There's a cross, there's a death side of the cross, and there's a resurrection side of the cross, right? This is the death side of the cross where Adam dies, where your first man born of Adam dies, and there's a resurrection side of the cross where the new man comes to life and listen, the same spirit that raised him from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Yes. It is the power, the resurrection power yes. of the Holy Spirit that brings life to your mortal body. It, it, let me say it again. It is the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit that gives you victory over sin and he can do it because Jesus already defeated sin at the cross. Hallelujah. That's what the Holy Spirit's working through. Yeah. He's working through the finished work of the Christ. Listen to me. The work is completed. That's why miracle that's why we can believe God for miracles. That's why we can believe God to, to rescue our loved ones. Yes. That's why it, no, it's already done. That's why we can believe God for healing. It's already done. Jesus purchased the healing when he died on the cross. He said it is finished. Listen, we can believe listen, we can believe God that our mind is sound for he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love and of a sound mind. You can believe it because Jesus paid for it now. Can you believe it? Yes. Can, can, you, can you believe God? Yes. Yes. Lord, help us to believe yes. you. 
according to your word and not the whispers of the devil. Right. Not the lies of Satan. We're going to believe you, God. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. See, you don't always see it and you don't always feel it. But just because you don't see it, just because you don't feel it, don't mean he ain't working. Yeah. And not that, just because you don't see it, and just because you don't feel it, don't mean that he didn't already do the work. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's a completed work. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's moving. Praise God. And then he says this, verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. Yeah. Look, man's Praise sins God. were judged by God on Jesus. Now, that's a heavy, heavy price. God the Father sent Jesus. I don't have too much longer. I know this has been some heavy, some heavy stuff. But listen, we're almost done here. Praise God. We're going to worship the Lord a little bit longer. Amen. You can worship him as long as you want. Right? Amen. Praise God. Niall will hang out. I know that. I know other people got some stuff they got to do, but I'm not just messing. I'm not picking on the rest of the musicians. I'm just saying, praise the Father. Hallelujah. Listen. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of the judge, the ruler of this world is judged. Man's sins were judged by God on Jesus. The world without Jesus will be judged with the world's ruler. Let me say that again. You're either on team Jesus or you're not. Right. Right. And if you're not on team Jesus, it means you're on team world. And if you're on team world, you're going to be judged with the world's ruler. They chose him and the world over Jesus. That's why we are we must partner with the Holy Spirit. We're not all gonna carry a cross, we're not all gonna stand behind a pulpit. I don't even know what you think about all that street ministry stuff. We're not all gonna go into a prison and preach. But guess what? We all will have opportunity with our friends when we sit down with them. Amen. <clears throat> we all will have some opportunity. At work, the point is, is that God will open a door for you. Yes. And the question is, will you allow the Holy right. Spirit to use you? No, this See, this is real Christianity. Like, I can, listen, I'm, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to say it. I can remember going to the old church in Franklin, and look, I love that pastor, and I'm telling you right now, I believe he's probably the he's the best presenter of the gospel that I've ever sat under, and I just bar none, absolutely. I wish I could. I mean, look, but anyway. But I'll never forget one time he preached a message on personal evangelism. And I'm telling you right now, it was the most uncomfortable message I've ever experienced in the entirety of my life. You're used to it. <laughs> like, you people are so used to, from behind this pulpit, us talking about, per, about being an evangelist. All of y'all. Y'all have not heard it so much that, the, that really and truly, even if you're not knocking on doors, there's, there's a zeal burning in most of your bellies. If you have not been witnessing to Jesus, I'm telling you, witnessing Jesus, I'm telling you, we've been doing, who, who, okay, let's just go ahead and do it. Who told somebody about Jesus this week? Go ahead, raise your hand. And that's what I'm trying to say. Look, at if you look, if you can look behind you, there's about 15 hands that are raised in the air. The, the spirit of evangelism is in the house. The spirit of evangelism is in your belly, amen? And I'm just here to tell you that that's the way it's supposed to be. But in that church, it was so uncomfortable because that wasn't something that was commonly preached. Because we've entered into a church age where what they're, what they're trying to tell us is that it's a social gospel. We're just trying to make people feel comfortable. We're just trying to get them a, give them a place where they feel comfortable to come. We'll just lavish love all over them. And I'm all about the love of God. Okay, but, but, then, but, but and then we just hope that through osmosis, you know, that, but then, Lord, help us. A lot of times people aren't preaching the truth. Because see, if you gotta if you gotta water it down to get them in, you gotta keep it watered down to keep them in. Yes. Right? And it makes people uncomfortable. But no, this is if you read the Bible for yourself, I let, let, let me get a raise of hands. How many people have actually read the whole Bible? Come on. See, what we got look at that's a good little crowd. So when you've read the whole Bible, you should have seen something in there, and you should have seen that it's God's will for God's people to be a witness for him in the earth. And that's what it says. The Holy Spirit wants to work with us. Amen. And so the word convict of guilt means this, to present or expose the facts, to convince of the truth. The Spirit of God works on the minds of the unsaved to show them the truth of God 
for what it is. Amen? And God uses human beings to help him in that. So if you've been doing that, and somebody comes against you and says, that's not true, Jesus isn't the Messiah, or that's not true, Jesus isn't the Son of God, or that's not true, Jesus is not the only way, truth, and the life. I'm telling you right now, my friend, you're not in a wrestling match with flesh and blood. Right. You're in a wrestling match with the spirit of Antichrist. You're in a wrestling match with the spirit of the world. And you know what? You know, I don't know. Maybe the Lord will tell you to rebuke them out loud, but you can definitely rebuke them in your spirit. And I'm telling you right now, something's going to give and you're going to win. Praise God, because the Holy Ghost is in you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. All right. In conclusion, singers, musicians, y'all can come up. Two quick things as they make their way up to the altar to close us out in some worship. Amen. Two quick things to mention about your relationship with the Holy Spirit. One, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, if you went and you read the whole surrounding context, it's talking about things like, clamor and backbiting and gossip and slander and malice. So if it's saying that, you know that it includes a lot of other stuff, right? <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make is this. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to say that those things grieve the Holy Spirit. So in reality, sin grieves the Holy Spirit because he's holy, right? And so what I want to say about that is this. The word grieve means to make sorrowful or to throw into sadness. So the reality is that we can cause the Holy Spirit to be saddened whenever we operate a particular way. If we're living a life, listen, if you're a believer this morning, and, and listen, God's grace is sufficient to set us free. Right. Amen? But it is not God's will for us to continue in a lifestyle of sin. It's not his will. And it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Um, but the Holy Spirit is the one that is able to, to set us free. So listen, if you you know, there's no telling, there's no telling. I mean, we don't have a huge crowd. Somebody watching on video, you know, before it's over. There's no telling what what we could be involved in, right? I mean, come on. Let me say that again. Make sure we're all paying attention. There's no telling what we could be involved in. There's no telling how we could be letting God down currently in our life. But I'm here to tell you right now that the Holy Spirit loves you. He loves you and he wants to work in you and he wants to pour grace and he wants to change you on the inside. Amen. Praise God. And so if you want to not grieve the Holy Spirit, two things have to happen. Number one, first you got to get saved, right? I mean, if you're not saved, then that means the Holy Spirit's not even in you. But once you're saved, then you have to learn about Jesus. And the only way to learn about Jesus is through the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the written truth about Jesus. Amen? So grieve not the Holy Spirit. Number 2, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You know, I used to, I used to say this a lot. Who do you fellowship with? I mean, the word fellowship means communion. It means intimacy. It means joint participation. I can't help myself. But, but like, I'm just thinking, if you're watching Netflix and there's a series, I'm just going to do it. If there's a series where there's lesbian relationships, homosexual relationships, and we're so into the series that we like the character, and and we can't, and, and we're like, man, I really, I really, I really, like, that's a problem. Yes. If, if the world is singing us a song, I mean, I'm just making it up. I don't know. I mean, there's been so many songs that I used to know, and I don't know none of the songs anymore. Um, but I'm just trying to make a point. When I used to sing with ACDC. And I used to sing I'm on a highway to hell. Or, or when I used to sing with David Lee Roth, uh, I'm running with the devil. Or when I used to sing with Vince Neal, I'm gonna take a sip of whiskey and jump into the saddle with you. Or when I used to sing with whoever, you know, uh, you know, with Ozzy Osbourne in Black Sabbath when he said Satan laughing spreads his wings. Oh, 
And then, and then you hit that little thing you did with his voice at the end of that. And it was like he was excited about that. Dude, that's a problem. That means I'm joint participating. I'm singing. I'm declaring that. It's almost like in that song anyway. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and sing it because I ain't going to do that. In that song right there, it's like I'm almost invoking it. You understand? Because what, what he's singing in that song is he's singing that it, it's called War Pigs and it's, and it's talking about the end of days and it's talking about the Battle of Armageddon, I believe. And it's talking about Satan winning and spreading his wings and laughing. And so every time that I'm singing that song with him back in the day, I'm singing, I'm, invo I'm invoking that. I'm like, yeah, come on. Like, and I know that that's an extreme case. Most of y'all aren't singing songs about Satan, but what about the songs that are out there now? About fornication, about, about sexuality, about drugs, about, you know. The point is, is that I'm talking about fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Joint participation with the Holy Spirit, not with the world. You gotta be careful who you make friends with. You gotta be careful who you become intimate with. Because I'm telling you right now, if you make friends with the world, it's going to affect you. And if you and I truly want to see the Lord, now listen, I'm telling you right now, man. The Spirit of God will convict you. Don't be looking at me cross-eyed. Okay? The Spirit of the Lord will convict you. Don't look at the at the messenger cross-eyed because I mean, he's, he's the one that runs with us. Amen? And, and if we'll allow him to have his way in our heart, he'll change us. So look, maybe you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Today's the day. Amen? Amen. The Word of God says today is the day of salvation. Multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision. Amen. And maybe you're watching on video. And then you say, I don't think I've ever received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that, listen, we're going to pray a prayer. Amen. And, and you, you, if you're sitting in your living room or in your bed, then you know what? I recommend that if the Holy Spirit's been dealing with your heart, that you get out of your bed, get on your knees, and, and, and begin to pray. Because what you got, what you need to pray, and maybe somebody in here right now, you would pray this prayer. And listen, whenever we used to get saved back in the day, we'd run. I like, I like that what that preacher Jeremiah Johnson was saying. He's like, when you was living in the world, you was out there shucking and jiving in the daylight, for, and all out in the open, so that everybody can see what you're doing. And then nowadays, when you're gonna get saved, we gotta get everybody to close their eyes so that somebody can just raise their hand up real quick. No. What we need to do is, is we need to make a public profession of our faith. Amen. I remember whenever that sister was preaching on sin and the Holy Spirit started to convict my heart. I ran up to that altar. But look, at the same time, I'm going to tell you, you can get saved in your seat. I am going to tell you, you can get saved still laying in your bed. It's just got to be from your heart. You got to ask the Lord to have his way. You got to believe Jesus died on the cross for your sin. If the Holy Spirit's knocking on your door, you need to invite him in. Amen? You need to say, Jesus, I believe. Come on, say it with me. Go, go, yeah, go ahead and close your eyes. <laughs> go ahead and close your eyes. Say it. Say it in your heart, even if you don't want to say it out loud. Just, just agree with me. Jesus, I know that I was born a sinner in Adam. But I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you paid the penalty of sin for me. I invite you to come into my heart. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. Holy Spirit, come live in me. I believe, Holy Spirit, you raised Jesus from the dead. Holy Spirit, raise me from the dead. Oh, write my name in the book of life. Teach me your ways, O oh Lord. Lead me and guide me, Lord. Break the bondage of sin in my life, Lord. Change the desires of my heart, Lord. Make me hungry for your word, Lord.
Make me hungry to worship you, Lord. For your presence, Lord God. Listen, if you need prayer this morning, I want you to know the altars are open. 